This sixth lecture will take us into the actual text of the book of Ezra, and we'll be looking especially at chapters 1 and 2. You should be on slide 54, and we'll talk about the initial return of the Jews from Persia to Jerusalem. Slide 55. As you open the book of Ezra, it says, In the first year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word Yahweh spoke to Jeremiah, Yahweh moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and to put it in writing. And, of course, there is the decree of Cyrus that the Jews could return to build the temple in Jerusalem. The fact that the initial verses of Ezra link this return to the prediction of Jeremiah requires some discussion. In the book of Jeremiah, in chapter 25 and chapter 29, there are references to the return of the Jews who would come back after the exile to rebuild the temple and to rebuild Jerusalem. Jeremiah set the time of the Babylonian captivity for 70 years. Now, because he said it for 70 years, and because the book of Ezra cites the word of Yahweh to Jeremiah, it's important then to take a look at some of the options about calculating these 70 years. For one thing, because the word of Jeremiah is linked to the decree of Cyrus, it would look, at first glance at least, that the end of the 70 years should be at the time of the decree of Cyrus. But if we actually look at that, and and we know that date quite well, that date is 539 B.C., if we track backwards 70 years from 539 B.C., we're not going to come up with the right amount of of time or, or historical junctures that would make sense of this. If you go only back to the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of Solomon's temple, which was in 587 or 586 B.C., you only have 47 or 48 years And so the time period between the fall of Jerusalem and the decree of Cyrus is more than 20 years too short. A second option is possible if you, uh, again, move backward from the decree of Cyrus in 539, all the way back to the time that Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, changed his fealty from Egypt to Babylon. And at that time, there was the initial deportation of some of the young men of the kingdom of Judah to the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon so that they might learn the wisdom and the culture of the Babylonians. With that first phalanx of returning uh, of people who were exiled to Babylon, there would have been Daniel and the three young men that you read about in the book of Daniel. And this happened in 605 B.C. That certainly gets us closer to the 70 years of Jeremiah uh, it gets us to about 66 years, but it's still, even though it's close, is a bit too short. If we move backward from that another four years or so to 609 BC, we have the vassal ship of Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, to Pharaoh of Egypt. And if you go uh, actually with that as, uh, as an initial starting point of the 70 years, then in fact you're very close. 609 B.C. to 539 B.C. is 70 years. The problem with this, though, is uh, how would the vassal ship of Jehoiakim to Pharaoh Necho II be considered part of the captivity of Babylon? Uh, it actually begins with a vassal ship to Egypt. And so uh, while the, 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 the amount of years seems to be appropriate, uh, the actual circumstances are a little more questionable. So that gets us to option number four. And this one is the one that most scholars and most interpreters think to be the most likely. This option takes the 70 years as the time interval between the destruction of the first temple which was in 587 to 586 B.C., and the completion of the second temple, which will happen happen in about the middle of the book of Ezra. The completion of the second temple can be fixed in 516 B.C., and uh, if that is the, the, the correct year, then you really do have the 70 years between uh, the end of the first temple and the completion of the second temple. 
But if this is the option that is followed, then when you read the opening verses of the book of Ezra that says Cyrus, uh, the king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of Yahweh spoken by Jeremiah, made this proclamation for the Jews to return, it means that the proclamation is not itself the end of the 70 years, but rather is a historical circumstance that was very important for the fulfillment of the 70 years. And that fulfillment, of course, would not come until a number of years later when the temple would actually be completed. And yet it would have been the decree of Cyrus that made it possible for this return and for the temple to be completed. So those are the basic options you have for calculating the 70 years that are mentioned by Jeremiah. And the fourth option, the last one we talked about, is the one that seems most feasible, both in terms of the length of time involved and also in terms of the circumstances involved. It would make sense, in fact, that the destruction of the first temple and the completion of the second temple would be the 70 years to which Jeremiah seems to refer. Slide 56. Again, as you read the opening verses of Ezra, you have this direct reference to Cyrus, the king of Persia, making a proclamation that the Jews could return. And when you read in the second verse of Ezra chapter 1 that this is what Cyrus, the king of Persia, said, Yahweh, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judea. When you read that passage, it almost sounds as though Cyrus has become a worshiper of Yahweh. He certainly uh, acknowledges Yahweh as the God of heaven, and he acknowledges that it is Yahweh who has given him authority over the kingdoms of the Persian Empire, and it is Yahweh who has uh, indicated that he should be the one to allow a temple to be built at Jerusalem in Judah. Uh, in Judah. So we certainly know that Cyrus, at least uh, superficially, recognized uh, Yahweh as the God of the Jews and one to whom he owed a certain amount of allegiance. Um, but we also know that Cyrus' decree was not only for the Jews. If you remember back to the Cyrus cylinder, the uh, cuneiform uh, inscribed barrel that we looked at in the second lecture, uh, we note that Cyrus' decree not only favored the Jews, but it also favored all of the other displaced peoples of the empire. People would be able to go back to their homelands, regardless of where they were from, and they would be able to rebuild their temples and to worship their ancestral gods. This was specifically applied not only to the people of Israel, but to uh, the people who were rebuilding temples to Nebo, to Bel, to Marbidi, and various other deities of the ancient Near East. So with that in mind, it would seem that Cyrus is simply a polytheist. He is willing to recognize Yahweh as the God of the Jews, but at the same time, he is willing to recognize the various deities of other peoples within his empire. Uh, there's a very similar type of thing in the book of Isaiah. Uh, Cyrus, of course, is, is specified by name in the book of Isaiah as the one who would allow the Jews to return. In fact, Cyrus is called the Messiah of God. He is, the, the, the term the anointed is used, is used of Cyrus in Isaiah. And that might make you suppose, of course, that, uh, again, Cyrus might be a worshiper of Yahweh. However, if you read carefully the Isaiah text, even though chapter 45 begins with, this is what Yahweh says to his anointed to Cyrus, if you go all the way down uh, a little bit later to verse 4, notice what it says about Cyrus. For the sake of Jacob, my servant, uh, of Israel, my chosen, I called you by name and bestow on you a title of honor. Now, this one who is called by name and who is given a title of honor is Cyrus. But notice the succeeding phrase at the end of verse 4. Even though you do not acknowledge me. So in spite of those rather exalted titles and descriptions of Cyrus, it's clear that Cyrus does not actually acknowledge Yahweh, not in a true sense of the word. He is not a worshiper of Yahweh. He is simply a polytheist and he is recognizing the God of the Jews, just like he would recognize the God of various other peoples in his empire. So in spite of the, the, the descriptions, Yahweh clearly states to Cyrus that you do not know me. 
So Cyrus is not a true worshiper of God, even though he becomes a tool by which God allows his people to return to Jerusalem. Slide 57. Cyrus' edict allowing the Jews to return to Jerusalem appears in Ezra in two different forms. One of them is in the Hebrew language. The other is in the Aramaic language. The Hebrew form is the one that is in the opening of the book of Ezra in verses 2 through 4. And this Hebrew form is probably the one that is proclaimed and, in fact, uh, heralded among the Jews in written form, allowing them to return. The one that we will read about a little bit later in the book of Ezra, which is in chapter 6, is actually in the Aramaic language. And this one, as you will notice, uh, is actually part of a memorandum that was recorded and stored in the Persian archives. There had to be a search of the archives to find the original decree of Cyrus, and this is the one that was found. But the one that they discover in Ezra 6 is actually in the Aramaic language, And further, it offers some details that we don't have in the one back in Ezra chapter 1. In Ezra chapter 6, it indicates that the temple was to be rebuilt as a place for sacrifice, and it actually gives dimensions of the temple. It was to be 90 feet high, 90 feet wide, three courses of large stones and one of timbers. Uh, It mentions also the gold and silver articles of the house of God that Nebuchadnezzar had uh, had taken from Jerusalem and brought to Babylon. Those would, were to be returned. Uh, but these kind of details are not in the original one. So, so both, of, both of these forms of the official statement are important, and they do come to us in two different languages. Cyrus, as is mentioned in chapter 6, and also is detailed in chapter 1 of Ezra, Cyrus consigned to the Jews all of those sacred temple vessels that had been plundered by Nebuchadnezzar. These are probably the very same vessels that Belshazzar had used on the night of his great feast that is described in Daniel chapter 5. And he and his officials uh, used the temple vessels for this feast to drink wine. And of course, it was on that night that the handwriting appeared on the wall and that the city of Babylon fell to Cyrus the Persian. All of these vessels then were consigned to the group the initial group that returned to Jerusalem. And you will notice uh, that it mentions specifically that Cyrus assigned them and counted them out to Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. Then, as the people themselves uh, gathered uh, together to make this long trek from Persia all the way back to Jerusalem, uh, many of the citizens of Persia gave them all sorts of gifts. Those gifts are mentioned uh, in in verse 6 of chapter 1. There were articles of silver and gold, and there were goods and livestock and valuable gifts, free will offerings. And the interesting thing about that is that this is exactly the same thing that happened when the Israelites first left Egypt. If you go back to the book of Exodus, you'll find that in the original description of the Passover, the Egyptians gave many gifts to the Israelites as they left Egypt and headed out toward the Sinai Desert. Now the same kind of thing is happening as the Jews leave Babylon and head back to Jerusalem. They are given all sorts of gifts from the natives of Babylon uh, to help them along their way. And uh, because this is so, then it's probable that we ought to consider the return of the Jews to Babylon as being a kind of second exodus, just as they once were in the exodus from Egypt to the land of Canaan. Now they are in a second exodus this time from Babylon back to Jerusalem. In fact, in the latter chapters of Isaiah, you'll find the Exodus motif is a very strong motif, and it captures that same kind of idea. Slide 58. At the end of Ezra 1, there is a description of the temple vessels that were counted out to Sheshbazar. And if you're a careful reader and took the trouble to do the math, you'll discover that the inventory that is given in verses 9 and 10 does not match the total number that's given in verse 11. The various categories of vessels in verses 9 and 10, gold dishes and silver dishes, silver pans, bowls, uh, various articles, those only add up to 2,499 vessels. But then when you get to verse 11, 
it says that the total number of articles of gold and silver were 5,400. So many interpreters reading this have, of course, been puzzled by the fact that the uh, itemized list does not add up to the same number as the total that seems to be given in verse 11. One uh, of the things that is important for this is that there is a parallel account of this counting out of the vessels. And that parallel account is in the Apocrypha book of First Esdras. You remember earlier in one of our lectures, we talked about the uh, various parallels between Ezra and Nehemiah and First Esdras and Second Esdras and uh, some of those works that are in the apocryphal literature. If you look at First Esdras, you'll find that the total figure is given as 5,469. And if that is a precise number, then the number 5,400 that you find in the book of Ezra must be a rounded number. Furthermore, when you look at the itemized list in First Esdras chapter 2, those uh, figures will all add up to exactly 5,469. And so the list, the itemized list, and then the total uh, figure at the end are self-consistent. Because of that consistency, some translations of the Bible, in English at least, will use the figures from First Esdras and replace them in the translation of the book of Ezra. You'll find this particularly in the Revised Standard Version, for instance. Uh, the, The itemized list and numbers that are in the Revised Standard Version do not actually come from the book of Ezra in Hebrew. They come from the book of First Esdras. Uh, Many English translations, however, leave the discrepancy simply as it is and leave it to the uh, interpreter to try and figure out uh, exactly what might be going on. The reason for this discrepancy is not immediately clear. Some interpreters suggest that maybe uh, in the book of Ezra, only the most important of the vessels were itemized. And so when you read the list in verses 9 and 10, which gives a number of itemized uh, collections, These would only be the more valuable of the vessels, and then the rest of them, uh, to make up the number 5,400, were just simply uh, 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 smaller vessels or vessels that had less significance. Others suggest that there may have been a textual corruption of the transmission of the numbers in the Hebrew text. Now, we don't actually have any alternative Hebrew texts that have various numbers other than the ones that we have in the book of Ezra as it stands. Nonetheless, we do know that the transmission of numbers in Hebrew uh, is somewhat difficult and is uh, more liable to textual discrepancies than probably other kinds of, of narrative uh, sequences. Uh, so a number of scholars wonder whether or not there may have been in the succeeding centuries uh, some sort of disruption of the text with a corruption of the transmission of numbers. In the end, we won't probably ever know for sure Uh, As it stands, the discrepancy is there, and uh, either it has to be resolved by appealing to the book of First Esdras or by appealing to one or more theories of why that discrepancy may be there. One thing for certain, there was one item from the Temple of Solomon that never made it to Babylon. And because it never made it to Babylon, it certainly never returned. And that was the Ark of the Covenant. And we need to say just a little bit more about that tradition. First of all, there are various theories that exist regarding the disappearance of the Ark of the Covenant. After Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple in Jerusalem, there are no more references to the Ark of the Covenant, uh, either with the, uh, the, the community of, uh, of Israelites that went into exile or with the community that came back to Jerusalem. There are no references to the Ark of the Covenant in the New Testament in the time of the Second Temple period around the period of Jesus. The Talmud specifically states that the Ark of the Covenant was not in the Second Temple. And so Jewish tradition is that after the Second Temple was built in the middle of the book of Ezra, there never was an Ark of the Covenant in the Most Holy Place. The Most Holy Place was simply an empty room uh, without furniture. The Ark obviously is not mentioned in this list of vessels that is at the end of Ezra chapter 1. Uh, those vessels uh, were taken to Babylon and then returned from Babylon 
uh, back to Jerusalem, but the ark is not one of them. But there is a rather interesting passage in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 3. And in Jeremiah 3 and verse 16, Jeremiah has a word about the Ark of the Covenant which may bear upon this question. Jeremiah says, In those days when your numbers have increased greatly in the land, declares the Lord, and by increasing greatly in the land, he means after the exile, because uh, uh, the context of unfaithful Israel is that the unfaithful Israel will go into exile, but then they'll come back from exile. And so Jeremiah says, uh, when your numbers have increased, men will no longer say the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh. It will never enter their minds or be remembered. It will not be missed, nor will another one be made. This seems to suggest that the Ark of the Covenant that originally was constructed by Moses was one of a kind. It would not be repeated It would not be rebuilt after the first one was lost. And in fact, in time, it would be unnecessary. Given that statement by Jeremiah, then, there are several theories about what happened to the lost ark uh, and uh, where it ended up. Uh, One of the oldest traditions is the Jewish tradition that it was hidden during the kingship of Josiah. According to the Talmud, Jeremiah hid it Uh, so that it would be kept for safekeeping. And if that tradition would be true, then the last several decades of the kingdom of Judah would have had a temple in which there was no ark. In fact, according to this theory then, the ark of the covenant disappeared during the first temple period, not simply at its destruction. This is not the only tradition, however. There is another tradition among the Jews, and this one is recorded in 2 Maccabees chapter 2, again, one of the apocryphal books, in which Jeremiah is said to have hidden the Ark of the Covenant in the Transjordan on Mount Nebo. Now, Mount Nebo, you may remember, is in the plains of Moab, and it is there that Moses died. And if Jeremiah managed to secret it out of Jerusalem and take it to the Transjordan, uh, he apparently, according to this passage then, would have hidden it on Mount Nebo. There is yet another tradition, and this one goes all the way back to the nation of Ethiopia. This Ethiopian tradition is not as old as the Jewish traditions, at least the texts that describe it are not that old, although the tradition might be very much older than the text. But going back to a particular text, the Kabra Nagast of the Ethiopians, which is a text in the early centuries of Christianity, it says that the Ark was actually brought to Ethiopia during the time of Solomon. According to this theory, the queen of Shiva uh, had come to visit Solomon. This is the the queen that is described as wondering about the wisdom of Solomon and and traveling from a great distance to come and see Solomon and to listen to his wisdom. According to this theory, the queen of Shiva and Solomon uh, were united in uh, either a marriage uh, we know certainly that Solomon married many foreign princesses, or even if it wasn't in marriage, uh, there was some sort of liaison there, and this produced a son. The Queen of Shiva's son, according to this theory, came back to Jerusalem and was given the Ark of the Covenant by Solomon. And this son of Solomon and the Queen of Shiva uh, took the Ark back to the Ethiopia, and it's been there ever since, the last uh, nearly 3,000 years. Now, uh, no one is willing to actually show Westerners this supposed Ark of the Covenant, but there is definitely a group of people in Ethiopia that believe they have it, and in fact believe that it is secretly hidden and that it actually is there today. Um, Scholars do not give much credence to this particular viewpoint, but it certainly gave rise to a rather interesting theory and one that was captured in a rather famous movie. Slide 60. Many of you may be aware of the Hollywood movie called Raiders of the Last Ark. The idea that the Ark of the Covenant was secreted away uh, in the time of Solomon and deposited in Ethiopia becomes the basis for this movie. And uh, 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 according to the movie, then, Indiana Jones, this uh, fictitious archaeologist from Harvard University 
uh, went after the Ark of the Covenant, and now finally it has been deposited in the United States Federal Warehouse somewhere, but its identification number has been lost. So even though it's supposedly hidden somewhere in the United States, uh, it is no longer accessible to the public uh, at large. Um, that, of course, uh, makes for quite a fascinating story, but probably not one uh, you want to take with much historical value. Slide 61. Now we need to say a word about the leaders of those who came back with the first Jews returning from Babylon to Jerusalem. These leaders can be divided into basically four pieces. Uh, one leader for the first piece, four leaders for the second piece, and so on. The first leader is Sheshbazar, who is given the title governor and prince of Judah. And he is the leader of the initial return. In Ezra chapter 1, it is Sheshbazar to whom were given the treasuries of the temple that they could take them back to Jerusalem in this initial return. However, Sheshbazar disappears from the record after chapter 1. Nothing is said about where he went or what happened to him. He just vanishes. And in his place, we have a leader by the name of Zerubbabel, who is described as the leader of those coming to rebuild the temple. Along with Zerubbabel, we will notice that there are three other figures that all figure in the rebuilding of the temple. One of them is the high priest, whose name is Joshua. And then there are also two preachers, or prophets, by the names of Haggai and Zechariah. These will be mentioned later in the book of Ezra, and they all are connected with the rebuilding of the second temple. The third piece of uh, of uh, the sequence in the returning of the Jews is the coming of Ezra. Ezra was both a priest and a scribe, and in his coming to Jerusalem, he was especially concerned with spiritual reform. By the time Ezra arrived, the temple was already completed, and so uh, Ezra is not coming to rebuild the temple, but he is coming to renew the covenant with the people of Israel and to help them establish themselves on a firm basis. And then finally, and this will take us into the book of Nehemiah, there is the governor Nehemiah who comes to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and to make Jerusalem a secure place. So these are the several leaders that we would be looking at in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah in these four sections. Sheshbazar in the first section, Zerubbabel, Joshua, Haggai, and Zechariah in the second, Ezra in the third, and Nehemiah in the fourth. Slide 62. There's a good deal of mystery about the disappearance of Sheshbazar from the record of Ezra. Even though he's cited as the leader of the returning group, his name is not listed in the list of those who returned that is given in chapter 2, beginning in verse 1 through 61. Rather, in this case, the leader of the group seems to be Zerubbabel. Now, Shesh Bazar is named later in chapter 5 when they are researching the archival records and trying to find uh, where the original authorization for the rebuilding of the temple is. And here his name is cited as a memory. But it doesn't say much about him, and it certainly doesn't say anything that happened to him or why he disappeared from the record. Both Shesh Bazar and Zerubbabel are named as leaders in laying the foundation for the second temple. And so this has given rise to uh, quite a bit of confusion over just who these men were, or were they the same man? Either Sheshbazar and Zerubbabel are the same person, but they have or this person has two names, or they are different persons, and Sheshbazar passes from the scene, possibly he died, or perhaps he went back to Babylon, just doesn't say. Most scholars accept this second opinion, that Zerubbabel and Sheshbazar are two different people. Slide 63. One of the reasons that most scholars think that Sheshbazar and Zerubbabel are two distinct persons is because they are certainly described that way in the parallel account of 1st Esdras. In 1st Esdras, it indicates that Sheshbazar actually came first and Zerubbabel came slightly later. And so if you read chapter 2 and chapter 4 of 1st Esdras, there it clearly indicates that these are two different people. Sheshbazar is commissioned by Cyrus, but Zerubbabel seems to be working under the commission of Darius. Now, one other connection is sometimes made. 
There is the reference in First Chronicles 3 in the genealogical references uh, to the people of Israel of a person by the name of Shanazar. And if Shanazar is the same as Sheshbazar, and some scholars think those are linked to the same single Babylonian name, then Zerubbabel would have been Sheshbazar's nephew. If you look carefully at the way the genealogy is constructed in chapter 3, Zerubbabel seems to be the nephew of Shanazar, and if that's the same as Sheshbazar, then they would have been related uh, by family tree. That brings us to the close of lecture number six.